I'm going to cite some people who disagree with you. <laughs> Please. Yes. Okay. Let's start naming names. <laughs> Richard Feynman. I'm sure this name rings a bell to you. He had called string theory a research dead end. Lee Smolin has said that string theory makes no new testable predictions. Peter White goes as far as saying that string theory is not even wrong because you can't even test it out. Eric Weinstein once described string theory as affirmative action for mathematically gifted people who don't want to understand <laughs> the real world. <laughs> Tough crowd. Okay. And your colleague at NYU, Pascal Wallace, who was on this show a few months ago, he went as far as saying that string theory is like a religion and physics is at a standstill because of it. It's become cool to hate on string theory for some reason. So first, can you step into the shoes of some of the critics of string theory? And can you present the argument as they were here today? Can you steel man the argument? Sure. Yeah. For, first, let me just separate two things. So, so there's quantum mechanics and there's string theory. What we were talking about just a moment ago, Gerard Assift, it's really about quantum mechanics. Yeah. And um, again, like string theory is a particular theory that is most interesting when you consider quantum mechanics, but there's a classical version. Um, yeah, so so just to separate those things. Now, why is string theory controversial? I think it's for a good reason. I, I think these these critics have a point. It's not that they're um, um, you know just uh, haters or something. I mean, they, they really do have a point. So, what distinguishes science from not science? And really, what distinguishes science from not science is falsifiability, um, and to some extent, predictivity. So, a scientific theory should be able to make statements that you can go and, and test in a lab, and there's the possibility that those statements will be proven false or at least the evidence will indicate that they're false. And if that happens enough and you have enough confidence in the experiments, then you will abandon that theory and the theory will be said to be falsified. Mm -hmm. And that's a standard definition of science. It goes back to Popper, Karl Popper, and probably before. Um, it's not really the way science is actually done, but it's close enough for, for I think, for these purposes. Yeah. So, um, so the real question, if you want to, a lot of these people, like when they say string theory is not even wrong, for example, um, what they mean is it's not making predictions which we can go out and test and, uh, and therefore possibly falsify. So, you know, for, first of all, I think we have to distinguish between classes of theories and individual theories in the following sense. Uh, if we get rid of string theory and we just stick to what we are very confident is a reasonably accurate description of, of particle physics, so that's the standard model of particle physics. The standard model of particle physics is a specific quantum field theory. It has a certain very specific set of interactions. It has masses for the particles, uh, values for the coupling constants. Um, there's a set of around, I don't know, 15, 20 numbers that you input into that theory, and then the output are predictions for particle experiments, for instance. So it's one in a class of theories. Now, many of those numbers are not perfectly well known, so it's, there's still uncertainty around precisely which quantum field theory it is. And when you do an experiment, which is more precise than has been done before, you could use that to refine your knowledge of those numbers. So you can imagine, you take the space of all quantum field theories, it's like a big, I don't know, apple pie. And now um, you take a slice of that, which uh, are theories that look a lot like the standard model, and then maybe a smaller piece, which are the theories that are consistent with current observational constraints. It's still not that small, because again, there are still uncertainties in these parameters. Um, and then every experiment refines it a little more. So you're kind of cutting away theories that aren't right, um, and you're left with theories that might be right, but you don't know which one. So string theory is a little bit like that. There are different versions of string theory, and within string theory, there are many different solutions which might describe a world if you were living in it. And it's, it's hard to say, uh, it would be hard to come up with an experiment that would falsify every possible version of string theory. But in fact, the same thing is true of quantum field theory. It's impossible to come up with an experiment that falsifies every possible version of quantum field theory, or at least I don't know of one. Um, it's easy to come up with experiments that falsify specific versions of quantum field theory. Mm -hmm. So really what you want is you want uh, experiments to be able to constrain what are the possible theories within some set. That's really what you want. Yeah. And in string theory, that is definitely possible to do. For instance, um, all string theories contain gravity of the form that Einstein predicted. So if it turned out that gravity was not the form that Einstein predicted, string theory is falsified. Um, all st string theories are uh, Lorentz invariant relativistic theories. If it turned out that the speed of light is not a limit, the relativity is wrong, or at least it's not, um, not what we thought it was, you could falsify string theory that way. The problem with these ways of falsifying it is that they were already known. It's like before string theory was invented, people already knew that probably gravity is what Einstein said it was. After all, that was in 1916. And similarly with relativity, that was even earlier. So they weren't new predictions but they are nonetheless falsifiable predictions. 
So to say that string theory is not even wrong or it doesn't make falsifiable predictions, that's not true. To say that it doesn't make predictions that are novel that we can test experimentally, that has a bit more meat to it. Gotcha. And now why is that true? Why is it so hard? It's basically because what makes string theory interesting is that it's a quantum theory of gravity. You're putting together quantum and gravity. And now it's surprising to many people, but gravity is an incredibly weak force. It's absolutely feeble compared to all the other forces. And, you know, one way to explain this is imagine a, a, a magnet and a paperclip. So you can pick up the paperclip with the magnet. You can hold it above the paperclip and the paperclip will move upward and get stuck to the magnet. And uh, it's doing that against the force of gravity. So the paperclip is being pulled down by the force of gravity of the Earth. The Earth is a massive object, extremely heavy. Um, the entire Earth is pulling on the paperclip. And then this tiny little magnet is pulling on the paperclip with a different force, not with gravity, but with electromagnetic forces. Yeah. And yet the electromagnetic forces win. Mm -hmm. So gravity is much, much weaker. Even though you have this huge planet, um, it's, it's much weaker than, than electromagnetic forces. Okay, so gravity is a weak force. Quantum mechanics is hard to test. We didn't even know about it until a little more than a century ago because it affects things on small scales and in subtle ways, mm -hmm. unless you know how to do sophisticated experiments with high precision. Okay, you put these two things together, talking about quantizing the weakest force by far that exists in nature, it's really tough to do experiments on quantum gravity. And this has nothing to do with string theory per se. Any theory of quantum gravity is going to have the same problem, probably. Maybe there'll be a surprise. It'll make some prediction that we didn't think of. But, you know, at first um, glance at it, you would say, it's going to be really difficult to distinguish between competing theories of quantum gravity because it's just really hard to measure any quantum effect in gravity at all. And so that's what it really boils down to. Um, now, does that mean we shouldn't be thinking about it? I don't know. I, I think, you know, people believe if someone says it's a religion, that's going way too far. And you know, it's, it's certainly not a religion. I promise you that there are no, uh, nobody's worshiping anybody. Um, when I was a graduate student starting my PhD, that was close to the, or it was one of the peaks of excitement around string theory. So it was when many people my age at the time were, were going into it because it looked so interesting. But even then, there were plenty of skeptics around. Um, you've got smart people who are putting their careers or are deciding what to do for their careers, right? They could do a lot of different things. And some of them decide to study string theory. Are all those people some sort of, I don't know, uh, uh, religious fanatics or, or idiots to do this? Of course not, right? They're making this decision because it looks exciting to them. Yeah. Um, it's not inhibiting the progress of physics. That's nonsense. I'm sorry, but that's just nonsense. There's everybody now, especially now, but even back then, Everybody now that studies string theory learns all sorts of other techniques in physics. They are actively engaged in studying condensed matter systems, classical theories of gravity. Uh, there's all sorts of connections to different fields, high like superconductivity, for instance. Um, and scientists, to make a name for themselves, they need to discover something new, something interesting. If it's something testable that gets confirmed, that's that's the best possible outcome. But you know, you're not going to be able to survive. You won't get a job if uh, if all you do is narrowly string theory, mathematical nature of it. That's very, very, very difficult to find a position. Uh, you really need to work on something else besides that. You got to work in cosmology. You got to work in astrophysics. So it's just not. Um, it's much less monolithic than I think one might think from listening to these critics. And there isn't really. I mean, I have. A lot of colleagues uh, that that know string theory, teach classes in it, they use it sometimes. Not one of them is just a string theorist. That applies to me as well. Yeah, we all do other things too. It's just one of many mathematical tools and ideas that we have at our disposal. And so, yeah, it might be the right theory. It might not. Um, it would be more exciting if it isn't, because that means there's something new that we haven't discovered yet. Mm -hmm. And everybody agrees with that. If if you could prove that string theory doesn't make sense, maybe it's illogical, like it's logically inconsistent. That would be fantastic. You'd become very well known if you could show that. Everybody would be really happy about it because now they could go and learn whatever is replacing it. They could yeah. study that inconsistency and try to figure out how to fix it. It would be a really exciting thing. So yeah, it's very different from religion where people just you know, aren't allowed to question the faith, really. It's exactly the opposite. We're all actively trying to knock it down and destroy it and shave away more pieces of that apple pie because yeah. that's how you make your name for yourself and that's how you discover something that wasn't known before.
Okay. Oh, but you wanted me to put myself in the place of these critics and make the argument for them, which I don't know if I did that. Well, you presented the argument and you provided a response to it. Okay. I think we covered yeah. both because the next question is going to be what's going to be your response to it. So you, you anticipated the question ahead right. and you brought it together. Thank <laughs> you.